Howdy, Psych92 here, and in this episode we're going to be finalizing our hardware and our code, we're going to be laying out our PCB, we're going to be going over some ways that you can get your boards professionally fabricated by services like Oshpark, and then finally we're going to fabricate our own boards using some DIY techniques. In the previous episodes, we put together a pretty good design for our synth, but there are going to be some minor differences between our original synth and then our final design that I'm going to be going over in this episode. The hardware bits are going to be right at the beginning of this episode, and the software bits are going to be a short footnote at the end. At the very end of this episode, we're going to have a circuit board just like we have right here. This is a DIY circuit board, and it's going to be uh, populated just like it is right here. Also, I wanted to apologize for the delay in getting this episode out. Uh, a few weeks ago, I graduated with my MS in computer science, so since then I've been trying to convince people to hire me. And also, troubleshooting this board took a lot longer than I was expecting due to several reasons that I'm going to go over later. And as promised in the last episode, I'm going to show off some of the sounds that I'm getting out of the final board as well. So let's do that now. So the first thing that I'm going to go into is a change that I made to the end goal. And if you remember from the first few couple of episodes, the very first things that I said was that I wanted all my stuff to be portable. So the original goal was to have BitBase be powered by two 9 volt batteries, but that's changed now. The reason for that is that if I wanted to power this with just two 9 volt batteries, meaning 18 volts, I would need to use a linear regulator to get 5 volts out of it for the Arduino and that would have been hugely inefficient and would have dissipated a lot of heat. So it would have been possible to use something like a switching regulator to get the five volts to the Arduino and then also keep it efficient. But the issue with that is number one, I don't have any on hand and number two, I didn't feel like it. So instead what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add another nine volt battery to the mix. So now BitBase will be able to be powered by the 18 volt power supply plus USB for the studio. And then also with the three 9 volt batteries if you want it to be portable. And I know that's kind of a weird power setup, so if you want to mod it and make your own power setup, it's actually pretty easy to do with the, the files that I have on the GitHub. So now that I've gone over that really basic change, now would probably be a good time to go over the full schematic and talk about any changes I made there, and also just talk about anything that might confuse you looking at it uh, without me talking about it. All right, so this is the finished schematic. I've tried to separate it into the sections that we've covered throughout this tutorial series, so this all should look pretty familiar for those of you who have been following along. The first section that you might notice is different is gonna be this digital oscillator section here, so let me zoom in on that. You'll notice that the ground has been replaced with V-ground, and that's because since we're using two different supplies essentially, we need to reference the digital supplies ground to V ground on the analog circuit. This is going to make sure that we have the correct voltage range. 
this. And now the analog power section, that's gonna be the exact same, so we don't need to worry about that. The envelope generator section is a bit different though. Just like we did with the digital oscillator, the five volt part of the envelope generator section has been replaced with V-ground. So again, this is necessary to give us the correct voltage ranges. Specifically, the transistors and the 555 timer have been replaced with V-ground. So as we can see, right here is V-ground instead of regular ground. Uh, here, 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 and there as well. Now the filter and amplifier sections are mostly unchanged as well. I do want to talk about the capacitors I added though. You might have noticed, but there are capacitors like this one, usually 100 nanofarads, sometimes more, on each of the chips uh, from their supply to ground. And these are called bypass capacitors. Basically, some analog and digital chips end up switching voltages so fast that their supply voltages end up dipping and creating radio frequencies. These bypass caps are placed as close as possible to the chips on the board to prevent that from happening. Also, that's something that you have to do consciously. You have to, when you lay out your PCB, you have to place those bypass caps as close as possible to their respective boards, um, or to their respective ICs. Also, once we get into the PCB view, I'll, I'll show how a ground plane also helps with those radio frequencies. And now those are all the really important differences. There is one other difference that I'm gonna show up here. And now, on the original schematic, we had the numbering right. Pin 4 went to this resistor here. Pin 5 went to um, the uh, bottom part here. But unfortunately, whoever was the dingus who put the MIDI connector in the part library screwed up the pin numbering. So pin 5 is actually pin 4, and pin 4 is actually pin 5. And I figured this out when I was troubleshooting my board because it wasn't working and I had tried so many different things um, and finally I just looked at it and I realized that the pins were the wrong wrong pins. The, the resistor was at the wrong pin. So yeah, that was very annoying when I figured that one out. So I, I put a big huge note here so that hopefully no one gets confused by that, but I know it is confusing. All right, so now that we have a working schematic, we can use Fritzing's PCB layout tab to lay out all these components onto our board. And since I'm trying to make this series as accessible as possible, it should be noted that I'm using through-hole components instead of surface mount ones. For those of you who don't know what that means, it's actually pretty self-explanatory. These parts here are through-hole parts. So these are the typical resistors and then ICs that you're used to where you can stick them in a breadboard. And they're called through hole parts because they go through holes. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Now the parts on this board are surface mount parts. And just like the name implies, they go onto the surface of the PCB and they don't actually go through any holes. So the benefit of this is you can make super compact PCBs like this one here, which this one's the one for dark arcade. But the downside is that they're really, really hard to solder and you also need a bunch of vias, which basically vias bring you from the top of the PCB to the bottom of the PCB and it makes a connection there so that you can route traces like that. So brief side note, on the very first uh, version of Dark Arcade, I made the mistake of going with 0402 resistors, which are this size, so basically the size of a dust particle, and I soldered all those in by hand. So guess how much fun that was. So like I said from before, we're trying to make this series as accessible as possible. So we're gonna go with through hole components. And we're actually not going to need very many vias at all. And I'll explain that a bit later as we go on. Anyways, let's get to designing our PCB. All right, so when we're done with our schematic, Fritzing is gonna give us a bunch of components and a bunch of lines that denote the connections between them. And this can be super overwhelming, so I usually actually just ignore it and then start laying things out by looking back and forth from the schematic and trying to think about how I can minimize the space between the parts. So for example, I'd go over here and I'd look, okay, here is my uh, digital oscillator section. So then I would look for all the parts in my digital oscillator section and thankfully I actually already have these right here. So here's almost everything from our digital oscillator uh, section, for example. So we'd place all that, try to get them as close as possible, uh, while still giving us enough space to route some traces. 
So of course the digital oscillator section should go by the Arduino. And another thing that you want to be thinking about, for example, is uh, you know, you have MIDI incoming here, which is high, highly, high frequency switching going on. So you want that to have as short a distance as possible to your whatever you're interfacing with, because otherwise that's going to create uh, frequency or uh, radio frequencies. So then we can start routing our traces, and this is a good place right here, for example. Routing traces is going to be the easiest part because it, it's essentially the same thing as the schematic view. Also another thing to note is that you know this is a two-sided PCB so you can go on the bottom layer here or you could go on the top layer. Uh, I just noticed that I routed these traces here on the bottom layer which that's not typically what I do. What I normally do is I route everything on the top first and only use the bottom layer if I absolutely have to and that the reason for that is it's going to give you more flexibility when you actually need to use the bottom layer uh, when as you progress in your uh, board layout. Now I'm not going to route this whole board in front of you guys, but I do want to bring up what happens when you absolutely can't route a trace. And in, in that case you need to use what's called a via. And vias are basically tiny little rivets that are used to jump between the top and the bottom layers. And we're trying to on this board to minimize vias since we're doing DIY vias, which is pretty difficult since most people don't have access to these small rivets. But what you can do instead, and what I did on my board, is you can use instead component leads. So just clip off the component leads to resistors, for example, and and put them from the top to the bottom through the hole, and then solder it on the, both the top and the bottom, and then you have yourself a DIY via. So to minimize these, what, we're, what we really want to use is these component leads here as vias, so the ones that are actually connected to components. But let's say that there's a point, and this will probably happen, where you absolutely can't do that. Well, in that case, then you need to use a regular via. Okay, so for the vias, you go down here, you go to PCB view, and there should be a via here. Here we go. And you can put that there. Now, this one is extremely small. This is for if you're getting your boards manufactured and you're 100% positive that... Uh, you're gonna get it manufactured, but then these are the ones that the manufacturer will probably use. But for us, what we're gonna do is we can put that down and change the ring thickness to something that's closer to our components. So let's, you can make uh, vias like this, and then let's say we needed to route this ground trace here. Take our via, connect it here, so that's on the top layer, but then we needed over here to be on the bottom layer. Well, then we can switch to the bottom layer here. And that's another thing that's really annoying about these wires is that it. So now you can see we have a via that goes from the top layer. This, this trace here starts at the top layer, then goes into the bottom layer, and then connects over here. Now, just from this small example, you wouldn't need to do that. But there are going to be cases where you do need to do that. So say that you need to get over a wire. So this, say this uh, bottom trace here needed to go uh, past this. Well, then it would need to use a via. So now that I've explained how to basically route and use vias, which in the context of this project, that should be all you need to know. And there's are a lot of great fritzing tutorials out there. I'm not gonna. I don't want to make this video a fritzing tutorial because that would take too long. But I'm going to skip ahead to what the full routed board uh, looks like. So once I had the full board routed, it looked like this. Notice how in most places I'm using my through hole components as vias, which allow me greater flexibility when routing. I only had to use six vias, so that's actually not too bad. You can see the vias here, for example, where I needed to cross this, uh, this uh, bottom trace here, and then this one here as well. Now there are two final steps though. And one is adding a ground plane. Basically, a ground plane covers the entire board with copper, allowing it uh, only small spaces between the traces and the ground plane. Like the name implies, the ground plane is connected to ground as well. This is also really good for limiting radio wave emissions. So it's not super critical in this DIY project, but it's still a plus. And basically it does that by acting as a Faraday cage. Also, it's going to uh, save us some etching because we'll only need to etch the space between the ground plane and the trace. Now, to add the ground plane, we go up here to routing 
And then we go to ground fill. Copper fill is just going to, it's not going to be connected to ground, but ground fill is going to be connected to ground. So we select that. And you can see now the ground fill is in place. We can also go up here to routing and when we go to ground fill, we can go to set ground fill keep out. Mine is set to 30 mils, which is pretty big uh, since we're doing this DIY process here, but we could make it smaller or bigger depending on our needs. And now the last thing that we need to do is run a design rule check. And that basically checks to see if there are any uh, overlapping traces or if anything is too close to the edge of the board. So let's run that. And to do that, you go here to routing again and you go to design rules check and it goes ahead and checks it for you. So we can see that everything is fine and it's ready for production. So we're good to go. Now that we have our actual layout done, we can generate the files for fabricating our boards. And Fritzing supports exporting as two different types of files. You can either generate uh, etchable PDFs, which is what we're gonna use for our DIY fabbing method, or you can export Gerbers, which Gerbers are the industry standard for PCB manufacturers. Now, both of these methods export multiple files, including the top and bottom copper, drill holes, vias, silk screen, and more. Now, if you're gonna be sending these to a manufacturer, they're gonna use all those files. But for our DIY methods, we really only need the top and the bottom copper. Now that you know a little bit about what we're exporting, let's go and export them from Fritzing. And I'm also gonna show you how you would use Oshpark if you wanted to send out for the boards. So since my final board was DIY, so I did it myself, and I didn't actually send out to get any boards manufactured from Oshpark, um, I thought it would be good to show you what, what it's like when they come. So they're gonna come in a bag like this, and there's gonna be three of them. So that's one of the issues with that, with getting them from Osh Park. You're gonna need three boards. It, that's the minimum. But they're gonna come like this and they're absolutely beautiful boards. They're purple solder mask and gold plated. I'll, I'll zoom in so that you guys can actually see this. But they're gold plated and the silk screen looks nice and everything looks fantastic. To export our necessary files, first we go to file then export and then we go to for production and for if we want to do our DIY process we do etchable PDF so we'll do that and then we'll also do the same thing for our Gerber files so we're going to production again and extended Gerber and now that those are both done uh, you don't have to do that yourself. These are on the GitHub if you just want to pick them up and you don't want to go through the process of downloading Fritzing and, and going through all this hassle, you could just get them on the GitHub. So now that we have both our etchable PDFs and our Gerbers, we're going to first go to Oshpark, which is a service that does PCB manufacturing. And there are many other services uh, like it, but Oshpark is pretty much the most popular for uh, DIY open source hardware. So we're going to use that first. So we'll go here, open up Firefox, I don't remember the name of the site, I guess just oshpark.com. So we can add zipped Gerber files. So then it starts uploading and processing them, and this can sometimes take a while. And then finally we have our boards. These are fairly large boards with a lot of through-hole components. Through-hole components make it expensive. Uh, Vias can make it expensive. And so the price is kind of steep here, honestly. $116 basically for three boards. I mean, a, per board that's not super bad, but it, it's kind of bad. Which is why another reason why I really like to do DIY boards. But if you wanted to go through this, then you would just hit continue and you check a couple other uh, things. You'd check the individual silk screens and all the different uh, Gerber files, and then you would finally send them out to be made, and then you would get them in uh, some time. Now that you know how to get your boards manufactured by Oshpark and other similar services, I'm actually gonna go and show you how you can make your own fully functional DIY PCBs at home. Now these DIY PCBs are not gonna be as beautiful as the ones that Oshpark makes, but I am going to include a link in the video description to a tutorial that is actually going to have a DIY method that's similar to mine, but includes a little bit more and it will make them almost as beautiful as the ones from Oshpark. And it's gonna include a silkscreen, solder mask, and even 
uh, solder stencils, which is something that you don't even get from Oshpark. I really want to stress though that even my toned down method is extremely time consuming and extremely frustrating. There's a learning curve to this and you will have many failures. Like I said before, another reason that this tutorial has taken so long to get out is that I've spent the last four days troubleshooting this board. And not to toot my own horn, but I think I'm a pretty great troubleshooter. So really what I'm trying to say here is that DIY board fabrication is not for the faint of heart. Now that said, there are perks to DIY board fabrication. The first of them is speed. Even with all the troubleshooting that went along with it, I still got it faster than I would from a service like Oshpark, which takes at best like two weeks. The other uh, benefit is that it's a lot cheaper, so cost. With Oshpark, you saw how expensive those boards were, and that you know was partially because you need to order three of them at least. This one here I made with materials that I already had on hand, which are also pretty cheap. Anyways, let's get into my actual fabrication process now that I used for this board here. All right, so the first thing I'm doing here is removing the uh, one side of the uh, photosensitive dry film and then attaching it to the copper clad. And what I do is I start at one side and I use an ID card, as you can sort of kind of see there, and I just move it along and try to remove any air bubbles with that um, ID card moving from one side to one side. So this is really the most difficult part of the entire process, is to not get any air bubbles. But as you can see, I'm really working that ID card there to try and remove any. And then when I'm done with that, I use scissors and remove any of the excess dry film from the copper clad. And remember, this is kind of wrapping around the copper clad since it is a double-sided board. And then finally I put it in the laminator and that's going to uh, remove any air bubbles that are, are there. And it's also going to help attach it better to the copper clad. And I usually do that a couple times, maybe uh, two to four times. Then the next step is to print the transparencies. And these are actually the wrong ones, uh, but later you'll see I actually have the right ones that I needed to invert them. But you're going to want to print two of each, and that's because if you don't, there's going to be too much light that comes in and you're going to end up overexposing. Alright, and then once you have your transparencies, the next step is to expose them. And I usually use this UV light here, and I do it for two to three minutes. And all the stuff with the photosensitive dry film needs to be done in really low light, which is why the first uh, video was so grainy. And then once the boards are exposed, then I flip it to the other side, and you can see the tape there that I'm using to hold it in place. And then I expose that one, and here's both sides exposed, looking pretty good. And then so the next step is to make a solution of sodium carbonate, and then put the board in there, and then the undeveloped part of the board is basically going to turn into this gum that you can wash off with your fingers, as I'm doing right here, under some cold water. And once that's done, then you're going to finally want to put it uh, under the UV light again to just make sure that everything is developed. And then I'm taking a Sharpie and filling in the holes so that we'll have more copper on there when I'm drilling and when I'm soldering. And then finally you have the ferric chloride to finally etch the boards. And I put it in a, just enough to cover the board and then put it in. And you're gonna agitate this bath every once in a while, uh, and that's gonna help etch it faster. All right, and so then you can just check and see if you've etched all the right parts of the copper off. And if you hold it up to the light, it's gonna be a lot easier to see, and also you can check if your holes align. Then you're gonna make a solution of sodium hydroxide. I kinda eyeball all these different values, um, but probably if I used more, it would remove the etch resist faster because that's the purpose of that solution there is to remove uh, the extra etch resist and it usually comes off after a while you might need to use a toothbrush to help get it off and when you're done with that your board's gonna look like that and this is an optional step but I use liquid tin to increase the longevity of the board and also uh, it looks really cool when it's silver so I like that too 
And then I'm just going to go over my board and, and check my traces, make sure everything is still connected. And it wasn't, so I had to use small wires and solder to just bridge any of the, the breaks that were there. And I actually had to do that on both sides. There were about six breaks, I think. The next step is to drill. And you're going to want to use a small drill bit and basically the size of a component lead and a drill press. So this is me using the drill press here. I can't imagine using anything other than a drill press. I would think it would be extremely difficult to drill such small holes. And then, you, of course, you're going to check your board and make sure that you have all the holes uh, done. So then once you're done with that and you're sure that all your holes are there and your traces are connected, you're going to start soldering in your components. And that's basically how you would do it on any other board. But you are going to be need to be careful that you're careful with your solder and you're not accidentally making any bridges where they don't need to be because there is no solder mask on this board. Also, sometimes you have sockets that go all the way down to the bottom of the board, which isn't good because you need to solder on both the top of the board and the bottom of the board. So this is a little trick that I use. I bend those pins over and that gives me just enough space to sneak in there with my soldering iron. And with the four pin ones, as you see uh, over there as well, I don't need to do that because they already have some space. But yeah, that's the finished board there with everything soldered. And I know that's kind of a rushed explanation, but I did link an article that uh, will explain all those processes much better and also include some other processes as well if you're interested in that. All right, so like I was saying earlier, there is a pretty annoying bug in the code, specifically in the MIDI part of it. So I just want to kind of walk through that and how I fixed it, which is a pretty simple fix, but um, basically what can happen here is say that you get a MIDI note on message, which is fine. So you get that and that works. It comes through here, uh, writes the first status byte, then sets the MIDI writing flag to zero so that it can start writing data bytes, writes the first data byte, and then finally writes the last data byte. It goes to the next uh, message and then it sets it to the writing flag to zero again so that it can start writing uh, data bytes again. The issue with this here is it doesn't catch the case when it's not a MIDI note on or off message. Uh, like for example, if you were to get a pitch bend message, well then it would go through this and the MIDI writing flag would still be under that. So then it would write a status byte to a data byte. So, then we're going to get a bunch of messed up uh, sounds. So if you if you were to play the synth and then you hit the pitch bend, you would get a bunch of messed up sounds, which are not is of course not supposed to happen. So basically we need to catch the case where it's a status where it's a different type of status byte. So what I did is this is the new code in this new buffer here. So we also have another variable here is status byte. So this is just bit shifted to the right by seven, so it's either it's going to be a one or a zero. And if it's a status byte, it's going to be a one. If it's a data byte, it's going to be a zero. So in the case that it's a MIDI note on or off, we do the exact same thing that we did before. We set a status byte, and then we start writing data bytes by setting the MIDI writing flag to zero. If it's a data byte, meaning the status byte equals is status byte equals zero and then the writing flag is less than two because we're only concerned with two uh, data bytes here. Then in that case, we write the data byte. And if it is a, if it's the last data byte, well, then in that case, we set it back to zero because we're gonna, it's gonna be running status and we basically move the write index over. So we can do the, do the same thing like we did in the uh, previous code for the running status or otherwise we just increment the mini writing flag if it uh, if we need another data byte for this message. So here's the part that catches it though, and it's this else here. So if we've received a different status byte than a note on or off, or we've received a data byte that's not associated with a note on or note off message, then in that case, we set the MIDI writing flag to 255, which means we can no longer write these data bytes here. And 
So that's gonna catch the case. You might be thinking, okay, well, what if you get a data byte and it goes to, and, it's, and it comes through here, it would still technically pass and be able to write a data byte to here. But this is going to save us because a, if a status byte comes that's not a MIDI note on or note off, then it immediately sets the writing flag to 255 and we're not writing any data bytes. So that's basically the code fix that I wanted to talk about. Uh, everything should work perfectly now. I've messed around with it, it seems to. Uh, if there's anything else, I will catch it in the next episode. All right, so that wraps up all of the electrical design for BitBase. In this episode, we talked about the final schematic, went over the final source code, we laid out our PCB, and then finally we went over some ways that you could send out to get your boards manufactured, or you could do it yourself using some DIY techniques. BitBase is finally almost done. There's only one thing that we need left, and that is a nice enclosure to tuck away all these messy internals inside. In the next episode, I'm gonna be talking about project enclosures. First, we're gonna be looking at some hacky ways that you can turn random household objects into project enclosures. And then we're gonna talk about how you can use free CAD software and 3D printing to produce custom enclosures cheaply. And yes, 3D printing and cheaply. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. The enclosure design is actually already completed and I've even actually started printing it. So the next episode should be out very shortly and I'll see you guys next time.